Now, we're very, very uh, delighted that we're going to have Kale with us here tonight. He will have a lot of great story to tell you, and he's definitely... Uh, the best person to be the director of the Faith Explained Seminar because uh, people who are going through their faith conversion will need someone like him to be with him. Um, at the same time, he has uh, spoken at many retreats and conferences, and uh, the most recent engagement is the Human Humanity Humani Vitae Conference in Toronto. Uh, and he also have addresses the uh, Legatus, for those of you who know, Legatus is an organization for Catholic CEO. And he has spoken at uh, Ryerson University, as well as Sarah House. Uh, currently, Kale is also write for uh, the magazine Catholic Insight. And he also serves as a pastoral assistant at uh, St. Justin Martyr Church uh, in Unionville. So, uh, long highlight, I can only give you a two minute snapshot. If you are interested in what more he does, Talk to him at the end of this talk. So uh, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. <clears throat> you forgot to mention the fact that I'm a terrible golfer. <laughs> Probably better than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I uh, just want to talk to you guys a little bit today about something called the theology of the body. That's what this is about. Theology of the body from men. In the movie, it came out in 1997 called, 1997, 2007 called I Am Legend, starring Will Smith. How many people have seen that movie? Remember that one? That movie kind of told an apocalyptic tale of the future, of course fictional. It provided a lot of great food for fun. In the movie, a so-called miracle cure for cancer is developed. The only problem is when they start giving it to people, it mutates into a virus and it wipes out 90% of Earth's population. You say, what happens to the 10% that survives? 1% is immune to the virus. They're completely unaffected. That includes Will Smith's character, Dr. Robert Neville. He's a military scientist. The other 9% who survive morph into these horrific human-animal hybrids known as the Dark Seekers. Like vampires, they come out at night to literally feed on the flesh of their fellow humans. They hunt down and try to kill the healthy 1% of the population. And Will Smith's character is trying to find a cure. He's trying to find an antidote. And he eventually is successful in capturing one of the dark seekers and takes him back to his lab. And as he's kind of examining this creature, he kind of gives himself a little note to self in his voice recorder. And he makes this observation. He says, Social de-evolution appears complete. Typical human behavior is now entirely absent. And that is an interesting analogy when it comes to sexuality in our culture today in North America. Because people have been made somewhat less than human in their actions and how they live out their sexuality. In fact, you could look at the various forms of sexual sin that swept through our culture almost like a virus. We talk about the incredible instances of fornication, premarital sex, pornography, an attempt at the redefinition of marriage, adultery, contraception, abortion, in vitro fertilization. All of these things are the symptoms of a very sexually ill culture. But a legend has appeared on the scene. I'm not talking about Will Smith talking about Pope John Paul II. And he has come up with what we believe is the antidote to all of these ills in our culture today. And it's something called the theology of the body. This was the first major teaching program of the pontificate of John Paul II. For the first five years after he became Pope, from 1979 to 1984, he gave over 100 talks on the subject of theology of the body during his Wednesday general audiences at the Vatican. And the fact that he did it during his general audiences is a bit of a clue as to how important he thought this was, because that's kind of like speaking to the universal church. This is for everybody. This is not some arcane philosophical project. This is something that's supposed to affect the lives of every person on planet Earth. But even the phrase, theology of the body, has become a bit of a mystery to many people. Uh, who can tell me what theology means? This is a pretty simple question. What does theology mean? Shout it out. The study of God. The study of God, or the science of God. Very, very good. This is where a lot of people get very confused, because they say, okay, well, how can you talk about a theology of the body? Because what does the body have to do 
with theology because you know theology is is very spiritual, right? It's it's kind of out there. It's kind of ethereal. It doesn't seem to have much to do with the body the study of God. That's because probably I think people have spent a little bit too much time watching television. Most people have gone to what I call the Philadelphia Cream Cheese School of Theology. You know, you know the Philadelphia Cream Cheese commercials. You know what is heaven like? It's sitting on a cloud. You know the angels are strumming their harps. You know, ah, you know. maybe the only physical object in heaven is the bagel with Philadelphia cream cheese on it. You know, I mean, boring. No wonder people don't want to go to heaven. You know, that's what it's like. But that's not what it's like. Not at all. Because our faith is a very physical faith, and our spirituality does not mean non-physical. And in the theology of the body, John Paul mentions that when the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God the Son, took on a human body at the Incarnation in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the body walked right through the front door of theology. Because from that moment on, God himself, the person of God the Son, possessed the body. And he still has it today. In fact, that's what we just celebrated at Easter. The incredible reality of the physical resurrection of Christ. And he ascended with that physical glorified body into heaven. And if you were to go to heaven tonight, and hopefully that will happen, but, uh, well, we good, I guess, if you to heaven, but we don't want you to depart so early. But if you were to see Christ in heaven, you would see him in his physical, resurrected, glorified body. And when we say, every time we go to Mass, when we say the Creed, when we say the Apostles' Creed, who can tell me what the last line of the Creed is? I believe in the, in the what? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay. But it goes on, what's the very last line? The resurrection of the body. Exactly. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That means that what happened to Jesus is going to happen to you and I as well. On the last day, God will resurrect all of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we will be reunited with a physical body, and we will live forever, hopefully in heaven, with a physical, resurrected, glorified body. And this is, in fact, what God did as kind of a preview of what he's going to do for us with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the first and greatest Christian. She is, of course, living that reality right now, assumed into heaven. And glorified body, and they're living in that reality. And so our faith is a very physical reality. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense of our Catholic worship. So much of what we do is so physical. The first thing most often do when they walk into a parish church is they reach for the holy water font and make the sign of the cross over their bodies. Why do they do that? It's a way of saying, I belong to God body and soul, my entire being. It's a reminder of our baptism. That's why we genuflect to the tabernacle. It's a physical sign of adoration that the King is present, Jesus Christ, in the tabernacle. We kneel and we pray. We stand for certain prayers and things like that because we worship God with our bodies. That's how we do it. In fact, one of my favorite verses in the scriptures comes from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 2. And St. Paul writes, I urge you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. A lot of people these days in our culture, they want to know what spirituality is. There's a lot of talk about spirituality. Nobody wants to be religious, but everybody wants to be spiritual. What is spirituality? St. Paul tells us. Offer your body to God as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual worship. That means that the worship that we offer to God in the body extends far beyond the church doors and out into our everyday, regular life. Into our workplace, into our leisure time, and especially into our family life. Because our bodies happen to be sexual. We were created male or female. And this is where the theology of the body really comes into play with John Paul II. We are um, very used to hearing in Catholic circles that we are created in the image of God. And when we talk about that, usually we're talking about the fact that we were created different than the animals. We have something that they don't have. They have bodies, we have bodies, but we have something called a rational soul. This is where we really share the image of God. Because they don't have that. They operate according to something else. What is that? Animals have instinct. They don't think about it. They just, it's kind of pre-programmed into them. 
we have a rational soul. We're created in the image of God. But in the theology of the body, John Paul II made an incredible revolutionary statement when he said this, man does not image God so much in the moment of solitude, but in the moment of communion. The moment of communion. What on earth was he talking about there? 